The title of the session, The Lives of Others, of course, gives us some indication of what it is biography basically does. Uh, biography is not autobiography. It has to narrate the lives of others. Uh, but the lives of others can also suggest a few other things as well. Uh, the lives of people who are other in some way. We've got to ask other to who and what. Uh, but perhaps other to the mainstream, other to our way of thinking, other to us simply in time. Uh, now, we have two distinguished people who really don't need too much introduction. If you want to find out more, you can read about them in the brochure. Uh, but in their long, long list of publications, you will see the titles of many biographies. Uh, Rajmohan Gandhi has written extensively on uh, the lives of uh, many of the figures of the uh, freedom fighting movement, including uh, Gandhi, of course, uh, but also Sardar Patel, and most recently, uh, Gopaldas Desai. Uh, perhaps a little known, maybe not after this book, uh, a little known freedom fighter from Gujarat, born a prince, uh, who in fact gave up his title uh, for a life pretty much as a common man and as a prisoner. Uh, and uh, Charles Allen has a number of biographies in his long record of publications as well, including on Kipling and, uh, most recently, the Emperor Ashoka. Uh, so I'd just like to start by asking both of you, how did you come to choose your biographical subjects? Yeah. Um, good morning, anyway. Um, I, I was very lucky because I stumbled into this as a, as a youngster struggling to make his way um, into uh, BBC broadcasting. Um, and I was putting together um, various programs and then somebody said, could you take on this job of being our field interviewer? And so that was really how I got my break. Uh, it was an area which I knew little, which was about the British in India. And so that was where I began to look at people's lives. Um, and that was a fascinating experience for me because I was going around the country talking to people in their dotage probably, you know, 60s and 70s, what, who were generally known as we call them survivors of the Raj, is, what we, is a, the title that we privately gave that group of people. And they were a group of people who felt that they'd been left out of history or that they'd been made jokes of. And it was quite hard to get past that initial um, carapace of, of, of self-protection. But eventually, I think they realized that, and I'm not saying I was on their side, but I had a certain empathy. And this is kind of part of the problem. When you get into looking at somebody's life, you tend to identify with them. And I wonder whether this is a problem that the biographer has. I mean, I've sat there with people, Field Marshal Sir Claude Auchinleck, the, the last British commander-in-chief of, uh, of, of the Indian Army. And I, he sat, I sat there and I saw him weep as he described that it was his job to divide the greatest army in the world in half. Um, and I've seen more generals weeping about the shame of uh, the defeat of uh, Singapore and how they became slaves of the Japanese. So it's a very emotional experience. And inevitably, you, you form a kind of bond which is not perhaps healthy for the objective biographer. So that was my starting point. In my case, my children have sometimes complained to me, why are you writing about your relatives? <laughs> because I've written about Gandhi. I've also written about my mother's father, who belonged to Chennai, Rajaji. Uh, fortunately, this last book of mine is not a relative, um, Darbar Gopal Das Desai. Uh, I'd heard about this man uh, when I was about 15 or 16 years old in Delhi, and Sardar Vallabhai Patel had died. He was, of course, a very famous man from Gujarat. Uh, we were in Delhi. My father was a journalist, editor of the Hindustan Times. 
I had never been to Gujarat uh, at that point. I was 15 or 16. And I asked my father when Patel died, tell me about other interesting people in Gujarat. He said, there's a man called Darbar Gopal Das. That intrigued me. Uh, I never managed to discover more from my father about this man. Then when I was working on my Vallabhai Patel biography nearly 30 years ago in Gujarat, I found this man figured in many interesting incidents of that man's life and life of Gujarat. But it was uh, an accident of meeting this man's youngest son, who was about four or five years older than me in the United States, met him a few times, Dr. Barindra Desai, a psychoanalyst, and he told me so many utterly fascinating things about his father that I felt that I had to write his story. So biography is in many ways a, a peculiar form of, of history. Uh, it's a form of history that uh, perhaps doesn't uh, focus on the macro. It, it, it takes us at its uh, point of departure the individual life. Uh, but uh, one is often dependent on other people's stories. So if we're talking about the lives of others, uh, to tell a biography, one has to rely on the narratives of others about uh, the subject of one's biography. And uh, when we're dealing with someone like Ashoka, uh, of course, we can't go to living relatives of Ashoka to, to find out um, <laughs> what he did, what he was like, how rough or smooth his skin was. Uh, but uh, we have to depend on a variety of narratives that were written by people from very different historical, religious, cultural, linguistic traditions. Uh, and in your case, uh, narrating uh, the, the life of Ashoka has also meant telling really a series of stories or creating a series of biographies about other people. Uh, that, uh, the biography of Ashoka is in many ways the biography of a group of people who have been demonized for a long time, uh, the British Orientalists and the German Orientalists. Thank you. Uh, so, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, what it means to create a biography that is at the same time a covert biography of the other people who have <laughs> done the digging, yes. the field work for you? Well, can I say that I've come to Ashoka after a very long journey? Um, because I, 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 I suddenly thought when I was talking about what became a, a radio series, Plain Tales from the Raj, um, was that it's one-sided. It's simply one-sided. Uh, and, and, and that really depends on what people want. Um, the, I feel very bad about two, two or three things. One is, we tried to do a series called Plainer Tales from the Raj, uh, which would be the Indian point of view. And, and there was no enthusiasm at all within the BBC to do it. Um, and I, in a way, I tried to make up for it some years later by, by looking at uh, one particular category uh, of, of uh, society within India, which was the Indian princes. And um, I suppose, yes, myself and my dear, dear late, my much lamented uh, colleague in, in, in Mumbai, Shard Dwivedi, we did a lot of interviews and we did tell that their story, but again, it's just one-sided. Um, and I, yes, anywhere I go in the, prince, in the former princely states, I get thanked for what I did, but I'm very conscious you know, that these were feudal societies which were very exploitative in many ways. Uh, and I wish again that the other side of the story was told. Um, Ashoka, as I say, I've, I, I've got a long way to go before I'm almost ready to deal with that complex way of... And the other is a question of material, is source material. I mean, when I think what Raj Mohan uh, had to deal with in dealing with the vast corpus of source material, uh, that you had with, you know, a national saint-stroke politician. Uh, and I think of how little material I had to deal with in the case of Ashoka. You know, it's, it, it's, there's a huge gap. And uh, what about uh, your process of, of teasing out a biography in which, again, there was very little information about uh, Darbar Gopal Das uh, Desai's yeah, he, early He life. was like Ashoka, yes. <laughs> in terms of lack of uh, information. But luckily, in his case, uh, descendants were alive. So I was able to interview two sons, two granddaughters, uh, had 
amazing information from them. Uh, there were some letters that survived. There were some newspaper articles, uh, which I did not see in the original, but copies of those newspaper articles from 70, 80, 90, 100 years ago also I was able to, to obtain. Um, this man, um, uh, when in 19, uh, he, he, he's, even now, he, this book has just been published, but until this book was published a few days ago, in Gujarat even, he has been totally forgotten. Prince Gopaldas Desai, an utterly unforgettable man, was a totally forgotten man until a week or 10 days ago. In 1922, um, a woman called Mani Ben Patel, whose father, Vallabhai Patel, most of you have heard of, wrote an article in a Gujarati weekly in Gujarat in which she described Gopal Das Desai as a modern day Harish Chandra. Now, Harish Chandra is another person who deserves a detailed biography, but of course, he's a tremendous legend that everybody in India has heard of. Uh, so a person who in 22 is described as a modern day Harish Chandra, by 1955, 1960, he was totally, totally forgotten. In the late 1930s, one of Gujarat's most successful, much loved novelists, uh, Javerchand Meghani, wrote a novel uh, featuring a prince called Surendra Dev, who was a courageous prince who protected women in distress, uh, who did courageous things, who defied the British Raj, uh, uh, went to prison, uh, and wrote his story, uh, wrote a novel about this prince, Surendra Dev, and afterwards said, well, Surendra Dev, of course, is Darbar Gopal Das Desai. So in the 30s, he was uh, much loved, greatly remembered, honored, of course, uh, and there he is. Uh, forgotten in a few few decades, uh, which again raises a great question, why are some people remembered, some people forgotten? Um, but it's, uh, this novel of Jharachan Meghani ends by saying, Surendra Dev must return. This prince was in prison in this novel, and he was wanted back by the people of Gujarat and Saurashtra. So Meghani says, Surendra Dev must return. So I'm very Glad that I've been able to cause the return of Surendra Dev. This is one way in which there's actually an uncanny convergence between the biographies you've written. You've both written biographies of princes uh, who had an extraordinary effect in their lifetime uh, and who were, for different reasons, written out of the historical record. Um, and an enormous labor had to be done to put them back in it. Uh, but I do want to ask a question about uh, uh, the subject of biographies and their social status. Uh, we, we are fascinated <laughs> by powerful people, um, even if they're people who gave up power or gave up violence. Uh, is it easier to write a biography of a powerful person um, than it is to write a subaltern biography. How, how does one go about doing that? And are there figures who you think uh, deserve a biography who might come from a very, very different background by virtue of their class, by virtue of their geographical location, by virtue of the community that they're, they're part of? Is, is there a biography that you feel needs to be written that has yet been written, yet to be written? Well, I think that there are 600 biographies that could be written here of the 600 people here. And it is indeed true, when, often when I meet people and listen to their stories, I feel like writing their biographies. Uh, sadly, uh, I can only do a few. One man whose uh, biography I wanted to write, this was decades ago, I'm sure I'll never be able to do that. Uh, he's not necessarily an unknown man or, 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 or a weak man, an author called Paul Gallico. I don't know how many here have read Paul Gallico, uh, but the, the, uh, the Snow Goose is uh, one of his most amazing books, which I loved decades ago. Uh, and he wrote such a range of uh, books. I said, I must find out about this man and write. But then there's so many great wishes we have that we are not able, able to fulfill. But you're absolutely right. Of course, it's also true that the biographies of the less 
famous people often get written in the form of novels. They are characters, they are the characters in, in most of the novels that we've been hearing about. But the, I, 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 I would like to reiterate this. I think all of us can find in the people we run across uh, the most amazing characters to write biographies of. I wish more of us had the opportunity and the circumstances in which to do that. I, I, I suppose I made my name as an oral historian. Now that phrase, oral history, is, is uh, one that's bandied about a lot in, in the UK today. And I remember that when we started doing these radio series, the BBC, uh, Plain Tales was the first, but there were another six or seven after that. Um, one of the outcomes of that by accident was the formation of the Oral History Society in the UK. And then within that, there was a very, very stark division developed between those who were saying, oral history is only about the forgotten voices and what you guys are doing is perpetuating the power structure. And it very quickly, we broke up into uh, what you might call traditionalists and Marxists. And, and again, there is this idea that the, you know, the forgotten man is what oral history should be about. Um, I, I wonder if I could pick out, um, the other awful problem is we have is, is hagiography, yes. um, which is bad biographies that about important people who should deserve a better one. And I wonder if I might pop, uh, I hope I won't um, put a, what's the word, a cat among the pigeons here. I want someone to do a decent biography of Dr. Ambedkar. I can't possibly do it. Now, this is a very unpopular subject, but I think I think the man deserves better, uh, and I don't know whether anyone here would agree with me. Uh, I think he is one of the great figures of Indian, of Indian history, and it, it's sad in a way to me that he's been, um, what's not exactly overlooked, but that he's been marginalized in some areas uh, as one of the great figures, founding fathers of modern India. Can I say that without upsetting too many people? Of course. People? Everybody um, here will agree with you. And indeed, Peria. <laughs> Every, everybody here agrees with you on, about Dr. Ambedkar and also about Peria. Uh, and uh, incidentally, Dr. Ambedkar has had some wonderful biographies already written. That are not hagiography? Yes. Okay. Uh, something unfair. Indeed. Okay. And, uh, but I'm sure more uh, mm. need to be written. Uh, I think I mean critical biography, that, that looks at a man, warts and all. Uh, can I explain that expression if it's not known to you? Famously, Dr. Um, Oliver Cromwell, when asked uh, he was going to have his portrait painted, he said, yes, draw me, warts and all. And um, I think I like that attitude. One of the pleasures of reading uh, both these uh, biographies is that uh, if we regard them as the lives of others, it's impossible not to think about the others to the others. <laughs> sure. um, so, uh, for instance, uh, reading The Prince of Gujarat, I, I found myself uh, fascinated by and wanting more about uh, Darba Gopal Das uh, Desai's wife, who, who yes. was an extraordinary figure. Absolutely. Uh, incidentally, his wife, Bhakti Lakshmi, which was a given name, and she was called Bhakti Ben or Bhakti Ba, is even today much better known in Gujarat than Darbar Gopal Das Desai. For one thing, she lived till her mid 90s. Uh, he died uh, at a relatively uh, younger age, uh, in his 60s. Um, but she's a very remarkable woman, a very uh, powerful woman. Uh, she had strong views. Uh, she did not like her husband's. Uh, stand against untouchability. Uh, she opposed him, but slowly she changed on that also. Uh, but on women's rights, she was a, a radical and a revolutionary, and where she found total support from, from her husband. Um, and then she uh, created several institutions in Gujarat. Uh, and both uh, she and uh, her husband Gopal Das were unusual also in the way they uh, built leadership into those around them. Some of the chief ministers of Gujarat that you may have heard of, UN Tabar, Balwantrai Mehta, Babu Bhai Patel, uh, and also the man who uh, helped create the Amul movement by bringing the peasants of Gujarat into a cooperative, especially the women, uh, women in the farming families of Gujarat, uh, Tribhuvan Das Patel, who, uh, who brought 
tens of thousands of uh, uh, buffalo owners and c cow owners together uh, to create this cooperative that is behind the great success story of Amul. All these people regard Darbar Gopal Das and Bhakti Ba as the people who brought them into responsibility and indeed into leadership. So you're totally right that Bhakti Ba uh, deserves a story. But uh, as, as I've said in this book on Prince uh, Gopal Das, by the way, Darbar in Gujarat is equivalent of Prince or Raja or Rajkumar. So when you say Darbar Gopal Das, it means Prince Gopal Das. Uh, I say in this that, because uh, this is a study also in some ways of the freedom movement in Gujarat, where there are, there was scores of people, even as I was working on this biography, that I wanted to write the biographies of. But uh, I, I was greatly hoping, and I'm hoping that as a result of reading this book, others will want to write biographies of people who deserve to be written of, and Bhakti Bhai is one of them. But so many others, uh, especially of course thinking of the freedom movement, who went to prison, who, who took great risks, uh, who uh, sacrificed, whose family lives were utterly disrupted because of the freedom movement. Uh, and, but these people did do very unusual things, and such people exist in the thousands in Tamil Nadu. Uh, all across India. So there are these thousands of biographies waiting to be written. I was going to say something that I don't know, I'm sure you were also like me inspired by the previous, the previous session here. We talk about women being written out of history. Uh, and again, I, 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 yeah, that seems to me that's an area. Here we are, three men. Uh, most biographies seem to be written by men, about men. And um, I can think of a few writers in England, Claire, Tomlinson, uh, Claire Tomlin and others who write about female uh, figures within our, our own um, literary tradition. But basically, it does seem to be a male-dominated industry. So I, I just, but, uh, and how, how unhealthy that is. Well, to ride this sort of slightly more political horse for a bit, um, uh, and to, not specifically with, the, uh, with respect to the issue of gender, although it's, it's one that we can and perhaps should return to. Um, but uh, the biographer is, or the historical biographer, is of course telling a story about a past life, the life of an other who belongs to a different time. But of course, it's a tale of a past other told in the present. And uh, the biographer, for whatever reason, feels compelled to tell the story because of some kind of conversation that she is having, or he is having, with the present. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear each of you talk, both of you talk, about uh, what it is right now that compelled you to tell the story that you told. Uh, well, in, in the case of Prince uh, Gopal Das, uh, a directly relevant aspect of his story is his attitude to the minorities, to the Muslims of uh, Gujarat. Uh, an attitude that was shared by uh, his sons. Uh, one of his sons, Mahindra Desai, who lived uh, till 2002 and beyond, uh, in a place called Vaso, uh, not very far from Baroda in Gujarat, so when mobs came in Vaso in 2002, targeting the Muslims of Vaso, Mahendra Desai, then in his 90s, uh, sat near a little memorial there for his father, Gopal Das Desai. It's called the Gopal Das Desai Tower in Vaso. And he said that these people who want to attack the Muslims of Vaso must kill me first before they go there. and the Muslims of Vaso were saved. So, uh, Darbar Gopal Das's Desai story is obviously so relevant to today's Gujarat. And uh, speaking of uh, today's Gujarat, or maybe not Gujarat, but Hindutva, there's a moment, and I want to call it a poignant moment at the end of uh, your biography of Ashoka, which was published in 2011, right? Um, in which you say, Charles, um, you're, you're talking about... Uh, uh, this is going to get me into trouble now that he's publicized. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, 
You're, you're talking about uh, Hindutva rewriting of history and how a prominent target was uh, Romala Tapar. And uh, that, uh, but you conclude this paragraph on a sunny note by saying, fortunately, it now appears that the tide has turned and that the voices of unreason are no longer finding an audience. Uh, I just wonder how you feel three years later about, <laughs> about that. I'm just checking that I'm packed. Um, <laughs> This issue of intolerance and to what extent we tolerate intolerance and to what extent we respond to intolerance with more intolerance is very much the issue of the day, not only here, but you know what's happening in France at the moment and how you do respond to what appears to be perhaps a provocation or if we turn it around the other way, a deliberate attempt to, to uh, impose your values on somebody else. It's, it's, it's a very hot subject. Uh, uh, we have such a, in, 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 we're so lucky in the sense in, in Europe of having, first of all, a, you know, fairly, uh, we've had years of experience of, of, of democracy. Oh, that, let's remember we talk about women's vote. English women only got the vote in 1922, I think I'm saying. My granny, I saw my granny's dowry. It was all given to my grandfather when she, so, it, these are all quite recent problems that we're dealing with. Um, I, I really don't want to get too deep into this. Um, I, I, but I do, we were talking about reasons for writing um, biographies. Uh, I've written two, one on Kipling, because I felt that there was an aspect for Kipling which had been misunderstood. Um, and there were two reasons why I felt particularly strongly about Ashoka, and one of which is because of what I've called Ashoka's song. It is an astonishing song. It's written up on his edicts, and in particular on his pillar edicts and his great rock edicts. And it was lost for 2,000 years. It was buried. It was quite literally buried and forgotten for complicated reasons, complex social and religious reasons. And he is the first man who says we've got to respect all religions. He is the man who asks us to, you know, to love our neighbors. He is unique among emperors in saying, I'm going to make, uh, I'm not going to uh, extend my Janapada uh, by conquering my neighbors. He, and he says, I'm no longer going to conquer you in the south. I'm only going to conquer you by force of moral force, by my ideas, by my compassion. And that seems to me a very, very, and I'm sure that is why uh, Nehru picks up the guy and, and writes about him in the discovery of India uh, uh, as a model. Um, and famously, you know, he writes his letters to his daughter, that I think is the first version. He picks him out as an ideal person who can represent all the values of India, not just the Muslims or the Jains or the Hindus or the Christians, but somebody who, when he writes his Dharma, we were talking about this, I don't want to say too much about this, but uh, in his early phase, he's quite deliberate. He calls himself a follower of the Buddha. But when he actually sits down and writes his great edicts, the seven pillar edicts, which you see in Delhi and elsewhere, and on the rock edicts that you see at Junagadh and in Orissa, Simon's called Odisha. Um, you can see that there he's, he never, never mentions a religion. He talks about a dharma, it's a code of ethics. And that's why I thought he was really rather a precious person that, that um, had not yet been understood enough in, in India. I hope that doesn't sound arrogant to say that. I have to say that in England also, my book sank like a stone in England. Nobody wanted to read it about. And I remember my publisher saying, you know, oh, you've got all these Indian names in this book. Uh, um. What, did they want you to replace the Indian names with nice English ones? That's right. <laughs> we'll call Ashoka um, Andrew from now on. Well, uh, I can I, I say, when I took this idea to my publisher, he said, yes, yes, Ashoka. Yes, I remember. He, he's the one who founded Fatipur Sikri, wasn't he? <laughs> But I, uh, you're quite right that for a long time, uh, India had forgotten Ashoka. India has a way, Gujarat for, forgets uh, Gopal Das. India forgot Ashoka for centuries uh, until some good British people helped India to remember and recall. So I thank your forebears for that, uh, Charles. Uh, however, in recent gener uh, decades, not just Nehru in his uh, discovery of India, but Ashoka has been for hundred years, possibly the most popular monarch of India, in India's memory. I think there's no doubt about that. 
And, and you, you can judge that by the millions of Indians who are named Ashoka. So uh, uh, I, I don't want you or anyone to uh, take away the impression that uh, Indians are very cautious of Ashoka. Indians love Ashoka. Uh, and uh, especially when he's played by Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> I, I think this might be a good opportunity to uh, turn things over. I, I think we've reached a point where um, the title of the session um, has folded back on itself. Um, the lives of others also turn out to be very much about our own lives, uh, about the exigencies of the present, um, who we are, and what kind of past we need to remember in order to imagine a better future. So uh, let's call on people to ask questions if they'd like to raise their hands. I think there are people rushing around with microphones here to... My question is addressed to Mr. Gandhi. He talked about the inability to... I mean, there are so many people to write about, but one can only do so much. But don't you think the publishers in India, they should commission a series of biographies. On one hand, you have got these leading people who played a huge part in the freedom struggle like Gandhi, Nehru and all. They have got their biographies. On the other hand, you've got the subaltern ones. But you have so many other fascinating people like uh, J.C. Kumarappa, for example. He doesn't have a good biography. Uh, Feroz Gandhi, we only know him as Mr. Indira Gandhi. But he was a huge person in his own right. And down here in Tamil Nadu, Sadashivam of Kalki, we only know him as Mr. MS. But what a fascinating life he had. I mean, these kind of things. I mean, there should be somebody to commission a series of projects. And certainly it's not the government, the publications division or the, I think they'll make a hatchet job of it. I think the publisher should come forth and people like you should be kind of guiding this kind of project. Just a suggestion. Uh, thank you for uh, your wonderful point. And all these people that you mentioned, uh, J.C. Kumarappa, uh, Mr. S uh, Sadashivam, uh, who is somebody, uh, Piroz Gandhi, they all deserve uh, biographies. I know somebody has written a J.C. Kumarappa biography. I don't know when it will be published. Uh, but I don't think we should wait for publishers to commission these things. I hope that some people will have uh, kind of fire in the belly to write about people that they uh, admire, they love, but I agree also with Charles in it, uh, that these should also be critical biographies and people are more interesting when we point out the contradictions that everybody has and they have, and the errors that they may have made, errors that we think that they may have made. Uh, but I think uh, it's up to us. If you really feel deeply about X, Y, or Z, let's go and do something about it. That's precisely. Hello. Sorry, did you want to? I think we have this. Yeah, I have a question, please. Well, can I? Can, I? can, can, can we I just, just let uh, Charles uh, have yeah. a word? Then yes. We'll hear, yes. I, everybody now has an opportunity to, to write about people they feel deserve uh, um, to be remembered. I mean, we have the internet, for heaven's sake. Um, you know, We've been exceptionally lucky that we've been allowed to put our, mandering, our meanderings down on paper and actually get somebody pay me for reading uh, these things. You know, we're, we're an exceptionally lucky um, minority. But everybody now has the chance to put down uh, a story about your... Uh, I encouraged my, my mother when she was in her, 80, in her 80s to sit down and write her story of her life. Um, jumping over a, a sofa in Bihar in 1936 during the great Bihar earthquake. You know, that was an interesting story. Um, and I hope everybody has a story in them. And the answer is, we've got the facilities to do it. Get it on record and then it's preserved somewhere. Yes. Yeah. See, how much uh, of a distance a good, a successful biographer has to keep between being a good biographer and a sycophant. <laughs> oh <dear. laughs> 
it's very dodgy, this. You make sure you've got, you, you write about someone who's, who's got a good sex life, and then you can get a bit of scandal going. Um, this is quite serious, actually, because I, in the, in the, may I talk about Kipling just very, very quickly? Um, Kip, to understand Kipling in India, and to understand why he's so, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a wrap. We haven't got time. All right, read the book. Kipling, India in the making of Rudyard Kipling, and his love of women, and how it comes about it is through his love of in, understanding Indian women that he understands their predicament and indeed understands India. I, unfortunately, we have been given the command. It is a wrap. Uh, but uh, I think there'll be opportunity for you to uh, follow Mr. Gandhi and Mr. Allen <laughs> out of the uh, auditorium and talk with them further. Uh, but thank you very much uh, to uh, Rajmohan Gandhi and Charles Allen. And thank, thanks all of you.